Today is Saturday, October 29, 2011. We are here today to interview William Henry Lee. Billy served in the United States Air Force from 1954 to 1958 and achieved the rank of E-5. I am Philip Lee, brother of Billy. Also present are my wife Esther, daughter Jenny, Lynn, Billy's wife, Ken, and Lola my brother, sister-in-law, and Bill, my nephew. This interview is being conducted for the Veterans History Project at the Library of Congress. We're in Wilmer, Alabama. Good morning, Billy. And Billy, if you'd like to start by just telling us a little bit about where you were born, when you were born, and why you decided to get into the military, which one. And just uh, go from there, Billy. Well, I was born in a little town of Durham, Mississippi. And it was a home delivery, which is rare these days. But we grew up in several different towns. We moved around quite a bit. And we were a farming family, and I was one of seven children. I was the second. I was the oldest boy. And we had a large family to support. So all of us kids worked all the time. The main reason I left home was to find something easy to do because I was working four part-time jobs, one full-time job and three part-time jobs after I graduated from high school. So the military was actually a vacation for me. But I actually, I don't think my brothers know this because they're swabbies, I wanted to join the Navy. And I had to pass the Air Force recruiter's office to get to the Navy recruiter's office. And he had that hook that they grabbed you and snatched you into the room as you go by. And he told me that the Navy had filled their quota for the year. So I could still join the Navy if I wanted to, but it was going to be six, to, six months to a year before they could take me. I believe everything he told, told me at that time. <laughs> So I wound up leaving for Jackson, Mississippi that afternoon. He actually, I, brought, I had to take, let his car back home. So the recruiter was at Grenada, which is about 35 miles from home. I hadn't quit my job. I hadn't told mother and daddy I was leaving. I hadn't told my girlfriend I was leaving, so I had to go back and do all these things. The recruiter met me at 1 o'clock and took me back to Grenada and put me on a bus and sent me to Jackson, Mississippi. There we spent the night, and then we caught a train to San Antonio, Texas. On, we had to spend the night in an army base there in Jackson, though, before the next day. And being a little uh, defiant, I sneaked out of the barracks. Had to crawl under some cots and things and sneak past the barracks yard and walk from the base all the way to downtown Jackson with a couple of friends, my cousin, who went in the same time I did. And then the bad part about it, we had to sneak back into the barracks sometime after midnight, which is more difficult than getting out, believe it or not. <laughs> we went through, I think it was 16 weeks of basic training. And like I said, it was a vacation for a boy like me. But all these poor city boys, they cried, they moaned, they whined, because it was tough for them. But I gained from 135 pounds when I joined. Within two months, I weighed 185 pounds. I ate good, I ate regular, and I had a lot of spare time on my hands through boot camp, which most people curse it for the rest of their lives. But from boot camp, I went to Biloxi, Mississippi, and... They had given me supposedly my choice, but they you put make a list of your choices, and of that list they say it's your choice, but they pick out the one that they want your choice to be. So I went to a electronics school and went through the basic portion of electronics for quite a while, and I was an honor student in that class. Got my picture on the wall, and I wrote a write up they sent to the Monica Herald in Calhoun City where my parents live. And then the school was divided into two sections. You had the basic electronics, and then you went into an individual type set. 
this is the type of set things you will actually be working on. This is where I got my first taste of this. I've forgotten what they call it. What the, it's not discrimination. This is what they. What, what's yeah, the word? Diversity training. Similar to it. I wrote it down in my book because I. Affirmative action. Affirmative action. I studied hard. I wanted to be the best at everything I was doing. And I didn't mind working and studying. So I had the highest score in my class in the second section. But because of the affirmative action deal, they made a black guy, honor student, even though he scored a whole lot less than I did, but he was the closest black guy in the line of, of the, sc in the scoring system. So that was my first taste of affirmative action. Even though I was raised with blacks, I had friends who were black, we ate with blacks, we played together, and we were friends. And you know, along that, that line, we moved to town sometimes, we moved to the country sometimes. We worked in the stores, and I, worked, I was working at a drugstore, and a black friend of mine that they used to play together as a kid came by the drugstore and I saw him and he saw me and he waved and I waved and I called him in and I'm the soda jerk. So I said, round up if you want something to drink. He said, sure, I'd like a chocolate milk. He's sitting at the counter and I fixed him a chocolate milk and he's drank it, drinking it. The druggist saw it and came up there and he chewed me out, ran around the off out and I told him to take his milk, chocolate milk with him. <laughs> Well, I was raised with that, but uh, we were friends. We played together, and I just loved their mother. She was my friend for years and years. So this deal I was just telling you about, it just it, it blew me away. The best person, the one that works the hardest, the hardest, is supposed to be the one that gets the recognition and promotion. Not just because of the color of your skin, but then I went on since I... Theoretically, I was the honor student. I got a choice of assignments. Well, it had always been hard for me to talk to groups, so I chose to stay on for instructor training. That is bad. You have to stand up and make these impromptu speeches before a crowd. After that, you're critiqued by the group that's listening to you. But I went on and I stayed as an instructor. I graduated that pretty good, pretty high standard, but... I stayed on as instructor there at Biloxi for a while. In fact, my brother just next to me was a senior while I was stationed at Biloxi. And he decided he wanted to come from North Mississippi down to Biloxi for a senior break. So he drove that his car down, and none of us had ever been to the coast before. I sneaked him on base, and he slept. I had a, a party room in the barracks as an instructor, and he stayed spent a week in my barracks, going in and out. <laughs> we went to Ship Island, we toured the beaches and things, and had just a, a great time together. But he was scared to death because I was sneaking him in and out of the base, in and out of the barracks. <laughs> but after I talked for a while, I decided I wanted to go on to different things. So. I kept going to the personnel office and asking to be transferred to Germany. And I always had a desire to go overseas and explore, especially the German part of the country. And I guess they got tired of me coming up and bugging them for a transfer, so I finally got my transfer, but they sent me from South Mississippi to Michigan. And I was scared to death, so I had a few days at home, and mother and daddy had a friend who worked in Michigan that was this and then I got to ride with him to Michigan but from there they assigned me to it was a fighter squadron I could work on that fighter plane F-86s these were the first fighter aircraft that the Air Force had and I worked on the radios and later or not that small fighter plane had eight different radio systems plus all the armaments and radar, but we worked in shops, which is strictly just on the radio portion of the thing. Here again, I faced this affirmative action deal, because I've always believed if you work hard, do your job, keep your mouth shut, you'll get promoted. You go right on up the ladder. By then, I was E, 
Creek, and I was going up to E4. You met with a promotion board, and you have personal interviews, plus you, you have the, the written test, and you also they go by your uh, job performance background and your recommendation from supervisors. I was passed over three different cycles, even though I was number one on the promotion list. They would work. They would change the rule every promotion list so they could promote a black person. And this happened. I, and it's not only it was unfair, but I know it was unfair to the black people too because I met the promotion board one time, and this is a from a base wide. They had big wheels and some enlisted men on the promotion board. They had a black lady that was the secretary of this group, and after they had interviewed me. And if we walked outside, she called me over and said, I want to talk to you, man. And this is a lady I did not know. And we walked outside to the hall, and she told me, she said, I, I loved your interview, and you impressed everybody. It's a cinch for you to get promotion, get a, your promotion, except for one thing. She said, I'm black, I know what's going on. You're the wrong color. It's going to be a while. She was right. And she had no reason to tell me that except she was impressed by my presentation to the board. Sure enough, they changed it again so that a black person got promoted over me, but I'm number one on the list and had been for months and months, or a year or so, I guess. But eventually I got promoted to E4. I faced the same thing when I was going up to E5. And I finally got promoted to E5 about six months before I got out of service and they changed the terminology for it. Now at that time it was staff sergeant but now they changed it so it sounds like you're a higher rank even though your grade level is lower. They changed it so hey sergeant and you're not really a sergeant you're just an airman but they did this just for messing with people's heads. But even that's the reason I say it's E5 that was staff sergeant then. And there again, I face this. That, this is my biggest beef. The military, they were the first people to mess around with affirmative action. They think if you take away from this person and give it to somebody that doesn't have it, everybody's going to be happy. But the man you take it away from is not going to be happy. I don't care how deserving the other people, person is. And this, this went on for the whole four years. It, it happened so many times. But then, the, the final star, I did not re-enlist because as, after I got to be staff sergeant, I was in charge of the night crew working on these fighter planes, which I love my job and most of the people I, love, I work with. I did my job according to the manual, tech order. They had merged our shops. At one time, there was a first, fight, a first fighter wing and under it, you had the 71st Fighter Squadron, you had the 93rd Fighter Squadron. So we started in competition because each group had, we had 40 aircraft each. And we would have competitions, and of course the pilots did the flying, but we were the crew behind them rooting, rooting for them. Then they merged us and the field maintenance unit under, into one shop. So you destroyed everybody's morale. So these, these guys, been for years, been we worked the same building, lived in the same building, but we were rivals and we had competition going. But they merged us all under one group and they brought this one guy in, captain, in charge of the electronic section. He didn't know how to turn a light switch on. So we had a problem aircraft that kept having intermittent problems with the radio on one of our fighter planes, and I was in charge of our night crew. They flew several times. The day crew was working on it, and they couldn't get it fixed. And my crew and I, we found out what the problem was. We fixed it. And this fighter plane, in order to get to the place we need to work, the, main, the mechanic crew, which my brother Ken was a mechanic, my brother Charles was a mechanic on these planes, they had to disassemble the entire tail section to get this problem fixed when I was working on this fighter plane. I fixed it according to the manual because I knew the manual backwards and forwards. It flew a test hop. It came back, everything worked fine. 
Then everything you do to an aircraft, you have to write it in, in the logbook. And you have to document what you did, but what authorization you had to do it. Well, all this stuff went to this captain that had come in in charge of the shop. He disagreed with everything I did. And he called me in for consultation, and it was not one of the calmest, quietest. They called me back in the next morning. He told me, you, you now work on the flight line. This is in Michigan. This is in October. I wasn't due to get out until March the 10th. The flight line is snow and ice and airplanes. No buildings. For the next, all this year, the next six months, I stood out there in that snow that was sometimes got 19 below zero. I didn't have to work on the planes. I would radio in to the shop. These were one stripers, two stripers, no stripers. They're sitting in there in the heat. They would come out with equipment, and I said, this is what you need to do. I just watched them do it. And then they'd get in their truck, and they'd go back to the shop. This was my punishment for not agreeing with this black officer who did not know what he was doing. So that's one reason I say affirmative action is not real pleasant for the people that are involved in it. So I did not go back into the Air Force. I didn't re-enlist. And just to prove a point, I bought a new car a month before I got discharged to show them that I was not afraid leaving this Air Force and going into civilian life. And I had married in the meantime. and. I, I lived. I made it this far. But I love my services, people I work with, but I hate affirmative action program because of the things that it does to the morale of everybody involved. But you're not helping people. You hurt more people than you help. Yeah. Well, I don't know if you have any questions. Now. Yeah, let's uh, kind of go back to the beginning a little bit, too. Uh, tell us a little bit about your boot camp itself, some of the things that you did actually there. Oh, you, you were running another thing. <laughs> well, we had a lot of schooling, and you had, we had a lot of spit and polish. You took all the floors are waxed on a regular basis, and... All your clothes have to be fixed. Such my brothers know. You roll your socks up. All your clothes have to be lined up on the right. You only have room for one or two civilian items. This is after. You're not allowed to drink coke. You're not allowed to eat candy. And if you pick off the wrong people, then you get a lot of detail KP. I don't care how good you are <laughs> or guard duty. There's a lot of pranking going on during, during boot camp, too. So, as I said earlier, I went in with a cousin, and we were stationed together all through boot camp. For instance, he was bad to... I wanted everything spit and polished. I wanted to fit in. But we had in, just snap inspections on a regular basis. they just pop in, call your attention, and they'd check out everything. He was a master of slipping. Since we used bunk, I had the upper bunk, he had the lower room, or vice versa. And so our clothes were hung. The same. He would either swap shoes, mine were, you could see yourself in them, and his worked. He'd swap them around to look like mine, and he'd go over and change the clothes around, turn them backwards. I'd wind up getting gigged and punished. And he got, he, the reward, he'd get a, a 12 hour pass or something. <laughs> Well, he paid for it dearly because I signed a lot of the things. I was the assistant squad leader. And he definitely knew that I knew, and he, he did pay the due for it. But a lot of pranking like that went on. And another thing, we had, there was a lot of rivalry between the Southern Boys and the Yankees and uh, California. California is a different, as a friend of mine said, it's not the West Coast, it's the worst coast or the other coast or something like that. But they came in, some blonde surfing dude came in there, this is boot camp, and he was showing his blonde curls and his muscles and his tan and stuff. Two or three or four friends and I got together late at night and decided he needed to be educated to get old Southern way of doing things. So 
the lights had to be out at 10 o'clock. So we all got a, we got a couple of blankets and threw over his bed, and we just beat the stew out of him with the shoes that were laying around. And he's and four or five guys on the blanket holding him. He can't do anything. So he didn't do anything except cry. He just laid down and cried. But so wound up, he he later he was made the squad leader, and I was just his assistant. I love that. But he had a single bunk. <laughs> well, the rest of us had double bunk. Well, the first time I had a chance to go to downtown San Antonio, they had a Breckenridge Park. They had rides, they had the fairground thing, they had the people that guessed your weight and all this. And I had gained so much weight, it didn't look like I was as heavy as I was, but I walked up this booth and this man, a lady was going to guess my weight. But she missed it big time. So my choice of gifts was a huge tarantula spider. It was made out of wires. It looked real. So as soon as I got back to the base, well, I went to this baker, this California boy, slid it under his blanket, and the blanket looked like it was perfect, no disturbance. Well, we all gathered around just as he came in, and the first thing you do, you take the top blanket off the end, you know, they're folded across your pillow and tight. And he jerked that thing up. This huge spider jumped up from the springs and bounced like this. He screamed like a girl again. He ran the spider. <laughs> we did a lot of things to keep, but this baker, after we finally. Now, I'm telling you, price is not real good, but it's not fair. Nobody liked it. And if they wanted something, they'd come to me, and I'd have to ask Baker, because even though he was nobody, he was, he said, squat this. Well, they finally started letting us have drinks over to a snack bar type. It's a, just a, a cover with vending machines. They had orange and grape and different drinks, and when you get the cup and you get a little ice, and then you'd hold it on there and put well, my cousin and I decided after we could, were allowed to drink, a soft drink, we were going over there to get some drinks. And I was back and said, you want me to bring you back a big orange? And he said, yeah. Because I hated this guy, and my cousin did too. So we got our drinks, and I fixed him. I almost filled his up with big orange, and then I went around behind the building, and I tinkled in the rest of it. <laughs> Take it back to him. Oh boy, he was, that was, he appreciated that. So now I appreciate it. <laughs> so we had our ways of getting back at people. Mm. They didn't always know it, but we did. Yeah. Any other good experiences in the basic training itself? Uh, you know, well, kind of. Yeah, we had bivouac, and my cousin and I stayed together pretty well, and looked out for each other. Now, when they issue you your stuff to go on bill right, you get a tent half. You don't get the whole tent, so you you have to pair up with somebody. But my cousin and I, we raised together and, and played together, and we always put our tent together. And keep in mind, we're country boys. We used to roughing it. And the majority of these people, these, these city boys, that they grass if it's too hot, they grass if it's too cold, they grass if a bug lands on them, they scream if a wasp comes at them, and they're just not used to living in all oh, this is vacation for us. So, one first night we we had our tent, Cousin and I put our tents, his name was Billy too, by the way, and we had our tents up, and you have to dig your little ditch all around it to keep the water from running in. It was cold. This is in March in San Antonio. And uh, we all went to bed. And the next morning, with these other guys, we're talking about 60 or 70 men, they complained about getting up early. Well, my cousin and I, we got up early, and we struck our tent. We had our rolls all fixed up and ready to go for on a march. Nobody else. They were out of their tents. They were moaning and groaning about having to get up. Well, all of a sudden it came on the dime, this dime fall of rain. It just poured for about 45 minutes. Everybody else was still snug in their tents. They was, nobody would let us get in tent with them. <laughs> we're standing out trying to wrap up with our tent half, getting soaking wet and just freezing to death. So they got the last laugh about, uh, about that. But then when we were on bivouac, are going on one of these forced marches. You have to take your pack, 
and it has to weigh a, or be a, all these items have to be in it a certain size. And it's pretty heavy. Jim probably know how heavy it is. But they, my cousin, he was a slacker. He let me cover for him all the time. So he had sneaked some big old orange juice cans from the, smile, from the mess hall, and he hid a bunch of his stuff that weighed anything. He wrapped these empty orange cans in his tent half to carry. So he's carrying about a third of the weight of these four marches. Then, when one of our deal at these marches, you have a bunch of uh, shell holes that you have to march in. You're under fire. They're throwing grenades down in these, these bomb craters, and you're having to crawl around them. And part of that training was you had the gas chamber. You actually go into this building that's out in the boondocks, go into this chamber. They fill it full of this different gases at different times, and you have to pull your mask off and then exit. And you can't leave until you take your mask off. And you have sergeants in there with all the paraphernalia that keeps you them safe. If you do it wrong, they make you go back and then go through it again. Well, I, I made it okay and did it fine, but my cousin Billy had his father was in World War Two, one or two, World War Two, I guess, had been gassed, and he had lived with the repercussions of being gassed, and finally died from it. So the thing that, that terrified him, the gas chamber portion of it, and we finally got through it though. But then we went out after the gas chamber. We were out forth marching some more, and they detonated one of those gas bombs in those craters close to him and he and I both got blistered pretty well from that. But since I was this assistant squad leader on this marches and I hear a bunch of complaining, griping Yankee mama's boys behind me, whining and crying. I'm leading through the deepest holes, the worst woods and the most mud and things. Of course if you're in the military you know you get in line second off there. Don't ever get to tell the line. So if you're marching, you're going to have to run when the one on the front is just walking along the pace. Plus, if he steps in a mud hole, he's only going to bog down here. But by the time the seventieth man comes, he's going to bog down by his feet. So don't ever get at the end of the line on these fourth marches. But we had one place that it was sort of a, a flat here, but there was a deep gully here. And I'm the front, and I'm going on ahead of them and making them whine and cry. And they had ropes that hanging down, and there was a road at the bottom, and it had a ditch at the bottom full of water. So this big old rope, I went down it real fast, and before I got to the bottom, I decided I'd jump. I'm going to show these Yankees how to do things. Well, I jumped, and I'm about 10 or 15 feet above the road when I turned this to the rope. When I turned this rope, the bottom wrapped around my foot. <laughs> I'm just perfect so that when I hit the bank with my hands, I drug back through all this mud water back to the bank. <laughs> I finally got loose and waited out. And nobody else did that. <laughs> I was the only one wet from here down. The rest of them were wet from here up. But, but we were still marching, but with me going through all these places, our drill instructors, they got so tickled, they pointed over towards us, clearing in the woods where nobody could see you. We went around, we sat down for two or three hours, it probably cut five or ten miles off by March. They were so amused at me taking these guys through these miles. <laughs> it was, we had fun, but it was pretty tough, but still it was a vacation compared to when I was working at home. Are there any Christmas time experiences in particular that you remember? Like, like what? Well, how did you spend Christmas? Oh. If you go home, fine. Otherwise, they serve turkey. There was no difference in the schedule. Everything's the same, but unless you could go home. Mm -hmm. Well, are there any of the people that you served with that you uh, kept in contact with over the years? Uh, believe it or not, I have, I met a friend at Kiesler, 
and we stay in touch. He's in Arizona right now, and there were three of us were pretty close. We went to church together. We run up down the, the beaches together. And I'll tell you a little story about that. He had an old Dodge, and this he's a nice young man. And in fact, he was he was going to take flight training, and he decided to go into the ministry rather than being you know, a pilot to kill people so he that's when he decided to go into electronic school where I was and he was from Illinois and his father was a minister and but he met this girl from Biloxi near Margaret and they dated a lot and we double dated some but this old Dodge was the one with big heavy front end and the car sprang painting the mechanics had collapsed on it. It looked like it was going downhill all the time, so I'm a half halfway mechanic. So I talked to my friend and we went to the junkyard and we found a new uh, set of core springs that set up a little bit higher for the front of we worked one weekend or so and put these new, newer coil springs on this thing and it made the car set up like it looked like it was going uphill. We were riding down Highway 90 there in Biloxi on the beach and we were talk, talking about, I was telling his wife, I said, boy, I wish we hadn't put these springs on, under the front of this car because it's going uphill all the time. And it takes so much more gas. And hey, I was, had $38 a month disposable income. Because when I went in, I was getting paid $72 a month, I think. I sent 40 of that home to my parents, which I did for two and a half, four years, or three and a half years of the four. I sent 40 months to my parents because it helped them with the bills and things. But when I told girls, now, we were going to church, we were eating a few things, and it was 30 something dollars a month. Or 20 something, 30. But I, started, I shared the gas bill with them, because nobody made a lot of money. And she started beating me on the head, and went, why in the world would you do that? Put the oars back on. Now, you still, it didn't, but it's going uphill. I told her, I said, we're having to go uphill all the time, and she believed me. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> But I just, one more about them, they're my friends. When they did, it was down, visiting with me. We were riding on the, up and down the beach. That's what you do your spare time, you ride up and down the beach and occasionally get out there yourself. But I, we were, A.W. and my brother, A.W. and I were in the back seat. And Mary and her husband were in the front driving. The road used to go right by the lighthouse, the, the brick road, and it went down lower, lower than the white house, and it had, I mean, not the lighthouse, it had walls, so you actually went down into dang it back up on the level, but, so we, just before we got to that, we had stopped at a stoplight, and this old Dodge, the sides were real high, but you couldn't see out real well, and, we stopped at the stoplight because it was hot, no air conditioning, let the windows down, and I started talking to a kid on the bicycle, supposedly, but there was nobody there. People in the car didn't know it, except my brother ain't there because he was sitting back there. I'm talking to him, and when the light turned green with my friend, he always went along with my jokes, he speeded up pretty fast. I'm still talking to this little kid on the bicycle and going down Highway 90, wide open. <laughs> Tell him to quit. He's going to get hurt. Quit. Tell him to stop. And tell him to stop, stop. we got to get this kid out of the road. <laughs> he believed his little kid was riding down Highway 9. Yeah. <laughs> 60 miles an hour on a bicycle. Mm -hmm. <laughs> well, were there any life lessons that you learned in the military that has been really helpful for you? I don't think any more than my father had always... My father helped me in the military. In the life lessons, mm -hmm. don't question authority. Say yes sir, yes sir, no sir, yes sir. You, if you do that for four years, you can breathe through it. <laughs> but he taught us well. <laughs> yes sir, no sir. You asked me a while ago about the friends that I met. I made a lot of good friends and things. I mean, weddings of my friends and 
I'm a godfather to one of my friend's daughters, and he's from Minnesota. But I did have a lot of great friends and good memories of my friends. But one of the things I want to mention, I love working on the jet planes. Especially the, this is the fighter and he's loaded with two and a half inch rockets and 24 of them. And we set all kind of records up pilots and we had the best crew and the best pilots in, in the whole Air Force. Occasionally we would go TDY in competition. We would go to Osco to Michigan sometimes. We flew out to Yuma, Arizona one time and they put us in these old C-47 I think. All between you and the, and the world is thin aluminum. They're not heated, they're not air conditioned. You get 10,000 feet, it's freezing. For one thing, they had an old gasoline motor with radiators and the exhaust blew through the this radiator and the fan was blowing to keep us warm. And we're 10,000 feet flying for two or three days. Well, it then a gasoline engine like a lawnmower and you get high altitude, no oxygen, the motor won't run. And you're freezing to death, so somebody has to pull them and try to get it started. Well, I was trying to be responsible, so I'm the one that tries to keep this good gasoline motor running. And when you exert yourself in high altitude, you pass out <laughs> like a boxer. <laughs> After I passed out from lack of oxygen, nobody else tried to make that motor run, so we just we huddled it with our blankets and, and tucked it out. But when we went to Yuma, Arizona for our competition, we were living in tents and we were working out of tents because we were a mobile unit that had to be able to move anywhere in the world at just a moment's notice. And we were self-contained and could do anything up to a point to keep our airplanes running. So we were on the back side of the field, and if we wanted supplies, we'd have to get on a, a tug, which is that tractor-looking thing that pulls the aircraft around, and we'd have to get on them and go down to the field maintenance where the shops, the permanent quarters were for the shops and the materials are. So one day we were going down there, and this, it was cold weather in February, and at night it gets cold in Arizona, February. But this tug is made with fenders and running boards so that several people can get on at the same time. Well, several of us were on going down there to get coffee and to get some supplies for our maintenance work. As one of the fighter planes from another outfit was taken off down the runway. And as soon as he got part of the way down the runway, he started making a weird noise and this, this black smoke was just billowing out of the back of this plane. But he was going too fast and too close to the end of the runway to stop, so he had to try to take off. There was a housing project that made it at the end of the runway, and he went over the housing project. But rather than taking his plane on out in the desert and ditching it, because he was in, in terrible trouble, he tried to circle around and bring it back to the base and save his aircraft. But he tried to stay away from the populated area of Yuma, and there were a bunch of mountains out there. And he actually crashed into one of the mountains trying to save the people and save his aircraft too. We watched him die. But the thing that was funny about it, we're standing around and you can smell the smoke immediately. But it just happened, so he's miles away. How could we smell the smoke? Well, we looked around and one of the guys that smoked, his field jacket was on fire. He was so excited, he'd lighten up one cigarette after the other and stood sticking his little cigarette in his pocket. <laughs> he's on fire. Mm. That's what we smelled. <laughs> that was comical, but considering the situation, but it just broke my heart watching somebody die. I wasn't that close. We knew he did it to save the people on the ground. But that, was, that was one of probably the worst experiences. But I, we had a bunch of guys, though, and I, I was telling you, we lived in tents. 
bunch and it would jam right up and most of the guys they'd be away from home and they were close to Mexico. They'd go down to Mexico and they'd come back with their tequila and they drink all night and then they work all day. And I didn't drink and I didn't like it but I had to put up with it. But they'd come in the they'd buy the sombreros and their whips and their stuff and they'd drinking and hollering and having fun in the tents but one guy was riding the broom with his sombrero and he beat his so-called horse. <laughs> this is inside of a tent now with 20 or 30 cots and, and he asked him to hit a, another guy with his whip. So he started to apologize and he lay down on the bed and had him whip. Now hit me, hit me, I want to make you. I didn't want to do it, blah, blah, blah. I just said, but he was drunk. I hate drunks, but you have to put up with it sometimes. But they would have funerals for the empty bottles. They'd have a procession and go out in the desert and bear the bottles and say the prayers around the bottles. <laughs> Some of it was funny, but I, I could have done without most of that. But, but the guys that you work with, it's real weird to, as I said before, I'm not a drinker, I don't like to be around drinking. If you want to drink, that's okay, but don't get drunk and come and let, expect me to put up with it. But they'd go out night after night after night. They'd drink half of the night and then come back to the barracks and they'd be hung up, hung over the next day. Or they'd go to the NCO club and just sit there and drink. I never could understand. I either went to the library or you know, went to a movie or studied my books for past time. And then you know, when I was at Biloxi, we went to church all the time. We were real active and had good friends that didn't drink and didn't do stuff like that. But the main thing I wanted to tell about was the deal in, in Yuma, Arizona when the, the plane crashed up, even though it wasn't ours. But, and to tell you how Uncle Sam works, though, and, and I'll add this. I came home from the military, and I was newly married, and lived in mother and father's house for a while, for a while because they had moved to Pasadena. And I got my job back at the little factory that I was working when I left home. And one of the ladies who worked at the factory knew there were not many opportunities in Calhoun City, which is the population of what, 1900, you reckon? And she had a friend that was one of the wheels at the shipyard in Pascadilla, Mississippi. And she told us, you need to leave Calhoun City again, but there's nothing here for young families. She got me an interview with this man at the shipyard, and I was hired to go to work at the shipyard. So I moved down there and went to, my wife and I moved down there and went to work. But in the meantime, I had found out they were hiring at Brooklyn Field, which is an Air Force base, and it was a combination maintenance outfit and a supply base. Well, they hired me on as one of the new, they had a new electronics deal that they were installing radio systems all across the United States. They call it GIA, Ground Electronics Installation Agency. So I was discharged from Mount Cummins, Michigan on March the 10th of 1958. In November of 58, I went to work at Brooklyn Field. They sent me in January back to Mount Clemens, Michigan and Selfridge Air Force Base to install these radio and, and transmitting towers as part of this system this, that was done, they were building across the entire northern part of the United States. So here I am getting away from the snow and the ice and went to the far south where I go without getting my feet wet. I, job they sent me right back to Michigan <laughs> to the same base and I worked there some and then they sent me over to Battle Creek, Michigan and another installation we were putting in. So we were there for a few months and then they sent me back to Mobile and it was getting hot then. My next assignment was Tampa, Florida. So they sent me to Michigan in the wintertime, they sent me to Florida in the summertime. <laughs> I thought that was pretty ironic. Yeah. And I, I enjoyed my work there but the traveling and being away from home, I wasn't too crazy about it. So I wound up getting a job at Brooklyn Field. 
a permanent job on the base itself in Lake Thomas. And I was a water communication maintenance man and a telephone installer in Brooklyn Field until they closed it 10 years later. So that's, I guess that's about all I, I can think of right now. Uh, thanks a lot for having me. Thank you very much.